looking at the very last part of uh, this section. It's 1.1, I call it day three. But in your, in your actual notes, it may actually be 1.2. Section 1.2 in some of your textbooks, in some of your textbooks, it's actually 1.1. But the idea here in day three, we're looking at functions again. So this is the third time we're looking at functions in, in a row. And, but we're also going to be exploring function notation. What is function notation? Well, first of all, we need to look at something called mapping notation. Mapping notation is a different type of relation that you may not have seen yet. Um, we've looked at all graphs are relations and possibly functions. We've seen all types of table of values that you've graphed in the past that are graphable, so therefore those are also relations. And we've seen um, equations that you can graph, and those can be functions or uh, relations. Now, in mapping notation, it's a different type of relation that we can see. Mapping notation is not like set notation and interval notation that we talked about earlier, but it's a type of looking at a relation. How can the information be displayed? So what you have is two sets of ovals. In the first set of ovals, you have a bunch of numbers. Now, here are some random numbers put there, but notice that the numbers are in ascending order. That means they're going upwards. Okay, we start with the lowest and we go to the highest. And then we have a second set of numbers in the in the bra in the ovals in the second set of on the second oval, and again the numbers are in ascending order. And what happens is that from one oval to the other, we map certain pieces of information. So in this case, what's happening is that these are like set coordinates. Negative 3 will go to negative 2, negative 2 to negative 2, 1 to negative 2. This is just an example of a mapping notation. It's not all mapping notations look like this, but they do have two ovals. They do have numbers in ascending order. Keep in mind that they are in order. And they have arrows coming from one going to the other. So think of this as your domain, and this is your range, and we're going from one to the other. So you have a domain and you have a range. Now, we can. I'm just going to show you another example of a mapping notation. Again, two ovals, numbers going ascending order, and arrows coming from the numbers going to values such as these. So one of these is a function. The other one is not. Remember what a definition of a function is. The definition of a function says that for every x, there can only be one y. So here, every x has how many y's? Each one of these has one y. Now looking over here, each of these x's, well, if you look very carefully, one of them has two y's. So the first one would be classified a function. The second one is not a function. It is only a relation. Why? Well, you need to identify why it's not a function, and that's because negative one has two y values. So it fails the definition of a function. Now, keep in mind the domain are only these values, so we just list them like we did in the past. In range, we do the same. We just list the y values. So again, the domain and range can be listed for mapping notation, but it definitely doesn't have x belongs to real or y belongs to real. So we talked about earlier that not always does domain and range have x belongs to real and y belongs to real. So again, the second one, you just state the domain and the range. All right, let's look, moving forwards. f at x is a way to represent a function f with x as the variable. So in the past, we've always looked at equations as y equals. 
the problem is is you may have more than one function on a graph so you have to actually identify which one is f and which one is uh, sorry which which y we're talking about when you have y equals well function notation helps us identify them as unique functions so we pronounce this f at x or f of x so the idea is that instead of using a variable y, we use the idea of a function f, okay, to represent a formula or a function. And uh, in brackets, it, the variable that is used in that function is used. So when you go into higher levels of math, sometimes functions or equations, if you want to call them, have x's and y inside them. We won't be seeing that in this course, but it definitely does happen. So an example of function notation, here's an example. f at x is equal to x squared plus 3x plus 2. So, what we're, so instead of y, we replace it with f at x. That's all we're doing, folks. That's all function notation truly is. Moving forwards, let's look at an example. Given f at x equals 3x squared plus 2x minus 1 and g of x, so that is another function g, okay, 4x squared minus 1, you're asked to determine the following. So you're asked to determine, let's see, when f at negative 1, g at 2, f at negative 2 minus g at 1, and finally the last one, g at x equals 0. So we're going to go through each one separately. What do you think this means right here? Well, look at the question. Look at what it's asking. Well, hopefully you're seeing that, oh, here it says x, but here it says negative 1. What do you think we need to do? That's right. We need to take x and replace every x in the f equation with a negative 1. So think of this as a math. If you were not understanding, if these were in different, it was in a different language, how could you represent mathematically, being an international language, how could someone understand what needs to be done without reading the English words? Well, they'll see this, and they'll see this and say, oh, we must replace that x with negative 1. So 3 times negative 1 squared plus 2 times negative 1 minus 1. We plug it all in, and guess what, folks? Without a calculator, we should be able to get 0. Yes, folks, you heard me. Sometimes out there in universities, there are universities that do not allow calculators. So it's important that you make sure that you're able to do some mental math. So let's practice some. G at 2. What is this saying? Well, we need to replace x with 2 in the g equation. And we're going to plug it in. G at 2 is equal to 4 times 2 squared minus 1, and that equals 15. Next one. F at negative 2 minus g at 1. Negative 2 in for the x's. 1 in for the x for the g equation, negative 2 for the x is in the f equation. So what we should probably do here is do these separately. First do f at negative 2, plug it in, and sure enough when we plug it in we get a value of 7. Then we do g at 1, and we do that separately. Uh, and then finally we put the two together, and we get the answer 4. So 7 take away 3 is 4. So this is important for you to understand how to solve. The last one, what do you think this is saying? When g of x equals 0, well, that means that instead of replacing the x, we're replacing the whole g of x with the value 0. So 0 equals the equation for g of x, and 0 is equal to 4x squared minus 1, well, what does that mean? Well, 0 is going to equal... Now, there are two ways to solve this. You can factor by difference of squares. Notice we take each factor and we find out it's plus or minus 1 half. The other way is that we can actually... Now, those of you who don't remember how to factor could actually do this question 
by moving the 1 over, dividing by 4, and then taking the square root. Don't forget that there are two possible values that could be squared to give us 1 quarter, one of them being positive 1 half, the other one being negative 1 half. So again, what we do is we move the minus 1 over, it became positive 1, equals 4x squared. Then I divided by 4 to bring this over here. I have 1 quarter is equal to x squared. What does that mean? We need to take the square root to get rid of this square here. We take the square root of the other side, the square root of 1 quarter. So imagine what we're doing is taking the square root just like that. Okay, the square root cancels the square, and we take the square root of 1 quarter. Remember, though, when we do that, we take the square root, we have to include plus or minus, and that's what's happening here. All right, moving forwards. Example number two. You're asked to represent the following list of coordinates. Here we go. These are the list of coordinates in a mapping diagram. So you're to go backwards with this. Represent this in a mapping diagram. So we have one set of eyes. Now, how do you do this? Remember, it's two ovals, folks. And what we do is we list the x values. Yes, the x values in order from least to greatest. So that's what happened here. Negative 5 is your smallest. Then it goes negative 3, then it goes negative 1, then 2, then 7. And then we list the y values. Now keep in mind, we never repeat numbers. So the y values are negative 2, 3, and 5 only. Even though there's repeats, we do not repeat it in a mapping diagram. The last thing we do is match. Match each coordinate. So we're going to match negative 5, sorry, 2 to 3 negative 1 to negative 2, 7 to 5, negative 3 to negative 2, and negative 5 to 3. Now, question for you is, is this a function? That would be an extra question maybe. Is this a function? Well, let's check. For every x, there is only one y. So yes, guys, this is a function. Okay, so here's some more questions, okay, that you can actually rep represent each set of data in a mapping diagram, and then refer to question 5 to determine if re each relation is a function. So here's some extra mapping diagram that you can do in addition to the homework that was assigned. All right, folks, have a numerical day. Take care.